Good morning everyone and welcome to the 10th session of this workshop which also happens to be the last session for the whole international workshop on HIV and adolescence 2023 So the title of this session is not dazed and not confused Implementing an empowering approach for and with adolescent sexual and reproductive health. Um, my name is Agatha. I'm from Inti Muda, Indonesia, and I am co chairing this session with the fabulous Miss Ali. She is, please give, give her her flowers, please. Yes. She is the program manager of Love Alliance at the Global Network of People Living with HIV. During the last two days, lots of presentations touched upon the challenges and the barriers adolescents face to access HIV and SRH services and for fulfilling their right to health and sexual well being. And now, our session will dig deeper into the gender norms and other social control mechanism that produce some of these challenges. We will also bring ideas on how we can challenge our gender biases and prejudices around adolescents' sexuality. And today, our keynote speaker and our oral abstract presenter will bring evidences on which harmful gender ideals and sexuality stigma affect adolescent girls and young women accessing HIV prevention and how these factors compromise their ability to adhere to HIV treatment. And later, we will host a youth-led panel who is bringing concrete ideas for interventions with the potential to empower adolescents to challenge stigma and to transform gender norms. And now I am so honored to invite our keynote speaker to handle her intervention. Her name is Miss Constance Niamukapa from Manisalen Center in Zimbabwe. Miss Constance currently holds the position of research operations director. A role requires her to act as the center research, projects country PI coordinating all fieldwork activities and contribute to the development of new projects. Their principal research interests are evaluation of national and promising new HIV intervention, including scientific trials and use of HIV prevention cascades, HIV and its effects on children and the social determinants and effects on of HIV infection, including intimate partner violence and HIV surveillance. With the title of Gendered Barriers to Prep, Unmasking the Challenges for Adolescents, Girls and Young Women, I present to you Ms. Constant Niamukapa. Okay, I'm Constance Nyamkapa as introduced, and I work for the Manikalen Center for Public Health. Okay, for public health research, and I've been with the organization for a very long time. Though I am a late groomer, trained as a social worker initially, and then when I was at college, I was very much interested into research, so I decided to divert from being a social worker into a researcher. And my main role has been to be the director for the center, SAID. But I would also want to say within the same project that we work, 
we have somebody from the Minister of Health, so we don't do research for the sake of writing papers. We do research for the sake of bringing change to the population in Zimbabwe. So whenever we have a new project, we take it to the ministry people and say, guys, is this going to work for you? Is it going to work for our population? What is it that we need to do more within the research so for us to bring change in terms of reaching our 90? Now Zimbabwe is talking of 95, 95, 95. And we seem to be doing well. If we work together, we will do well. So my presentation, I would not want to own it. There is a bigger team behind me. We have Professor Morten Skovdell, who is in Copenhagen, who is more of our qualitative expert, and he does qualitative. We are more of the implementers in terms of research, and we also make sure that whatever results we get, we feed it to the right people. So I'm not going to give prescriptions at the end of the presentation itself. I'm just going to leave it to us to discuss how best can we navigate this very tight rope that we're talking about. Which one is yeah. Oh no, I've gone to the right to the end of. Which one is it? The, I need to go to the next slide. Sorry, the names, okay. So I have no conflict of interest. The project was funded by the National Institute of Mental Health and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And the question that we were trying to answer when we did this qualitative study and also we had some quantitative aspect to it was why are we still having young girls and girl, adolescent girls and young men who are still getting infected with HIV AIDS when there are a lot of prevention methods out there? So we wanted to find out from the young girls themselves what is it that is stopping them from using the prevention methods. Thank you. So like introduced, we have gender matters within the activities that we're doing. Six out of seven new infections among 15 to 19 year olds in sub-Saharan Africa are among girls. And what are the risk factors for this? Early sexual debut, we had a focus group discussion with some of the young girls and say, if we wanted to find out from them, when are they starting sex and who are they having the sex? We discovered that now girls are starting sex as early as nine years old. We had, we had a counselor within the focus group discussion. We all asked them whether she wanted to be part of it so that people understand nine years and where are the places where you're having sex in church when you go for any yes when you go for church meetings when you go for school sports when we go for any other gatherings things are happening behind the church behind the school or behind the trees in the orchard and then the sexual relationships are mainly with older people and some of it is transactional sex, and some of it is coerced sex, and intimate partner violence. We also had a study before where we were asking women, which was a bit, I, I'm sorry to say, my African counterparts. We had a question we said, when you had your first sexual act with your boyfriend or your husband, did you initiate it? Or did you have a part in it? The results were shocking. So there is a lot that is happening. Nobody, most of us as women, we are not enjoying some of the sex that people think. I'm in a marriage, I'm enjoying it. No. It's coerced the sex, forced the sex. And our partners go, there is no rape within a marriage. Those are some of the issues that we're finding. So this is, okay, thank you. So when PrEP was introduced, it was held as a promise to provide women with the user control. Is this true? In theory, adolescent girls and young women can take PrEP daily without involvement of their male partners. Yes, it's true. 
acceptability studies from different sub-Saharan Africa indicate that adolescent girls and young women who are interested in PrEP and recognize, they are interested in PrEP and recognize its potential, but we have issues. In practice, adolescent girls and young women face hurdles to their successful engagement with PrEP, partly explained by fear of negative reactions from, from health care providers. We have a paper to that effect. Lack of support from relatives and friends and partners. Fear of partner reaction, intimate partner violence, complicated PrEP adherence, and what is the role of gender expectations in shaping adolescents, girls, and young women's engagement in prep? So our study was a qualitative st study. Like I said, we did 12 interviews with adolescent girls and young women. And we also did three focus group discussions with adolescents and girls and young women. And then the Cornell's notion of em emphasized femininity is more of the male dominant. Part of a larger, this is part of a larger intervention within the Manikalan Center, and we had the ethical approvals given by the relevant authorities, both in Zimbabwe and from our um, collaborating institutes overseas. Adolescents, girls, and young women who live in a men's world, men were talked of as the head of, head of household the one who makes all the important decisions. Men are said to have the upper hand, whereas women will have to listen. You get, I'm talking, this is not the qualitative, I'm talking about the quantitative. We have an, a household questionnaire, and then we have an individual questionnaire, which is so intimate and sensitive. So you get a household, you ask for the head of household first in order for us to be able to find out who are the people that we would want to talk to within the household. They're 15 to 19 year old. So sometimes we are denied information because the head of the household is not there, or we get the information on the household. And if you want to get to a participant who happens to be the wife to the head of the household, the woman will say, you have to wait until my husband comes in order for her to answer questions about her own sexuality. Patriarchy limited adolescent girls and young women's sexual decision making. It was mentioned that being a woman means that you have to sexually satisfy your husband. It is a matter of being controlled by men. Patriarchy not only puts them at risk of acquiring HIV, but challenges their engagement with PrEP as a means of protecting themselves. Stigma as a gender control mechanism affecting PrEP use. PrEP is perceived to violate expectations of what it means to be a good girl, not engaged in premarital sex or extramarital sex. In our context, I think where we work in one of our sites, there was the issue of virginity testing, but it has been stamped out, but it still happens. So what a good girl is, when you're getting married, there are other practices that also happen behind the doors. You get married, the first night that you're going to be sleeping with your partner, it has to be done with the aunts having put a white sheet on the bed where you're going to be sleeping so that they will be able to check whether you are a virgin or not. So for that, if I want to pray, people will go, already she has started sex. What's the point of marrying her? Adolescent girls worry about being judged and labeled as loose women or sex worker. And the other thing that we do, I'm sorry to say, when you are introducing programs, when we went to our study site, the first people who, who had PrEP tested on were <coughs> commercial sex workers. And then that is spiraled out of hand. Now they're getting PrEP. She is a commercial sex worker. We have spoken with commercial sex workers. They are people. They also want to have fun just like you and me. And when they go into it, they are not going there to get HIV 
or to do any mischief. We have to remember that every day. What I want, they also want. They are people, they are my brother, they are a sister, they are an aunt. Anticipated stigma constitutes a more hidden form of gender control mechanism that affects adolescents, girls, and young men's decision making regarding PrEP. There is stigma attached to young women who, are, who go looking for PrEP because it tells the community that you are sexually active. Everybody has to know. How do they know? Because even the health care worker, remember some of these are elder women who can't keep to what they are doing at the clinic. I become a mother, I am a father, and then that father person takes over the nurse that is supposed to be sitting in front of this kid who is seeking help. And they go, why do you want PrEP? That's the first question. And does your mother know? And does my mother know means I'm going to snitch on you? Next. Few adolescents, girls and young men believe they could take PrEP signature. Most of the adolescent girls and young men say that PrEP use or at least consistent usage would be impossible without their partner or parents' permission. Many did not believe that their parents or partners would be supportive of PrEP. My husband will refuse that is use of PrEP at at the end, you reach a dilemma because you can't go and ask your husband's decision to use PrEP. And then somebody went, I will be willing to use PrEP, but my parents may discourage me or refuse me to use it. There are not a lot of parents who will agree their children to use PrEP. They don't even want to hear about it. The discussion is closed as soon as you start. Mom, I think I'm sexually active is a taboo. Next. And then the struggles of adolescent girls and young women to keep PrEP use is hidden. Eventually, I decided to go and access press PrEP, but when I want to take the pills, at home, it becomes a challenge because my husband will always be at home. And at home, we don't have proper, proper bedrooms. Wherever, we might have a small suitcase where everything is tucked in. If you want to go in the suitcase, he wants to find out what exactly are you doing. And it tends to be violent. Keeping prep hidden for parents and partners is a challenge. Privacy is challenged by the very same gender norms and forms of social control that require men, adolescents, girls, and young women to engage with prep in secret. This is a school-going child. My mother used to get into my room and move stuff around. At times, you would come from school and she would have turned the whole place upside down. So where, where to put prep pills is a challenge. And then the takeaway message. PrEP is not simply a user-controlled HIV prevention technology. Its effectiveness and is highly dependent on the complex social fabric that adolescents, girls, and young women are part of. Many, not all, adolescent girls and young women in Manicaland are exposed to forms of good girl expectations, which, when enforced, those stigmatization and social control mechanisms affect adolescents, girls, and young women's ability or inability to engage with prep. Some adolescent girls and young women face dilemmatic choice. Face the social risks of engaging with prep, such as stigmatization, or even violence, or even abandonment. You are just out of the house. Now, because you're having sex, you think you are older, and you know you how to look after yourself go and do it outside this household. <laughs> Refrain from engaging with PrEP or accept the increased risk of acquiring HIV. So if I don't use, then I am at risk. Okay. So in conclusion, perceived social risk outweigh the perceived risk of HIV, obstructing adolescent girls and young women's uptake of PrEP 
PrEP is a potential to enrich the adolescent girls and young men, women with m a more fulfilling sex life, allowing them to focus on pleasure as opposed to fear and worry about HIV is hampered by gender norms and expectations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Constance, for leaving us with that uh, reflection, right, on the dilemmas that adolescent girls and young women face when, um, when making a decision to protect themselves from HIV and uh, leaving us with a challenge, right? The, the risk of being stigmatized, not as a good girl, as a loose woman, and losing the support of our partner, of our family, of our friends, still outweigh the risk of acquiring HIV. This is a very serious reflection that we aim to um, explore more in our conversation. Um, now I would like to invite uh, Elona Tosca from the University of Cape Town. She's going to be delivering uh, a, a oral abstract presentation on behalf of Bolade Hamed Bunognin. Uh, the title of the presentation is Gender-Based Violence Increases Mental Health Problems in Young Mothers Living with HIV in Lesotho and Zimbabwe. Floor is yours, Ilona, thank you. Thanks everyone. And for this presentation, I actually put Bolada's photo on so you can actually see. Um, and this is really his work and his um, gifted analysis of secondary data. So um, Agatha and Aline, like my prior disclaimer earlier, it's very binary when it's speaking about sex. So this is about young women because of how they identified in these large scale surveys. And we're really looking at three kind of data points that are important. Experiences of gender-based violence in the last year, mental health um, symptoms, and uh, substance use in this group. And this is, I think we've heard enough during um, the conference and the workshop to know why this is an important topic. So what um, Bolade did in this analysis is to use this large existing data sets, um, which we're very lucky to have for Lesotho, Zimbabwe, and a few other countries to try and see what were the links between in young women who shared that they had experienced past year gender-based violence, um, and I'll explain how that was measured, and two um, ex related experiences to mental health and well-being, symptoms of mental health distress and substance use. And he first looked at all um, young women and then young women, young mothers living with HIV. The analysis included over 8,200 18 to 24 um, year old uh, women and they were about half from Lesotho and half, just a bit over half from Zimbabwe. You'll see that overall there are high rates of having lost a parent before 18. Um, there is also one in five in Zimbabwe had become, uh, had been pregnant or had a child before 18. Rates of gender-based violence are between one in seven and one in five. And you'll see um, experiences of substance use and mental health symptoms in, in the right, so two sets of, um, of circles. 6% uh, reported substance use and one in five any mental health symptoms. And there were some differences by country. So the analysis that Bolade did shows both by each country what was happening and also he also pulled the data together. So at the top, I'll walk you through these bars. If it's green, it means that a young woman or the young women included there did not report experiences of past year, um, sexual abuse, physical or emotional violence in a relationship. If it's in red, it, they reported it in the last year. And if you go from the top, it's substance abuse. And we're thinking here about severe use of substances. We're not thinking just a little bit though I'll, I can clarify how that was measured um, with Bolade. In Lesotho, you can see that the red bar, and in Zimbabwe really, are higher than the green bar. So what this means is that young women who experienced gender-based violence in the survey were much more likely to, than those who didn't to experience, to report substance 
uh, use in the past 30 days. And you can see that those differences are also there in the bars at the bottom sorry, with mental distress in the past 30 days. And this was similar for both countries, even though the rates are a bit different by country and when the data was combined together. Polade and our team has been trying to understand what other factors may be making a difference. So he did this analysis including the young women's age, HIV status, their residence, rural or urban, their education level, whether they had early sexual debuts, so sex for the first time before 16, Constance speaking to some of your um, points earlier, pregnancy before 18, experiences of orphanhood and whether they were married. And even when all of these factors were included, um, experiences of past year gender-based violence were strongly associated with higher likelihood of substance use and mental health symptoms in both countries. And if you look, and this is the, the little black squares in the graphs, you can see all of them are to the right of the number one. But if you're looking at Zimbabwe at the bottom, you'll see that having a pregnancy before 18 and being a young woman living with HIV is really a bit worrying. So not only experiences of gender-based violence, but also early motherhood and living with HIV, something is going on there. So Bolade did something that demographers are very good at and I am not good at, which is called population attributable fractions analysis, which tells us, tries to tell us how much of the issue can be explained by gender-based violence. So um, don't ask me very complicated questions about that. But uh, when he compared young uh, mothers living with HIV who had experienced past year gender-based violence to those who didn't, we see that there were um, 20 percent lo less likely to have mental um, health symptoms and 27 percent less likely to report substance use. So if we're thinking specifically about how we support young women living with HIV and those who have become mothers, it's really important to link violence um, prevention and violence response services to um, mental health support and in some cases you remember substance use was not very prevalent but it was there in, in additional support. So just to summarize, uh, past year experiences of gender-based violence in over 8,000 young women in Lesotho and Zimbabwe were associated with substance use and mental health symptoms, particularly young mothers living with HIV were extra vulnerable and we should think about what additional layers of support they may need and the timing of them. I mean, it's really important to think about um, these and, and, and really have good models of how to do it. So I just want to shout out to our Zambia-based peer supporters. They're waving again. <laughs> who've, who've been actually putting this into practice. So they've developed and talked to uh, nearly 200 young mothers and young women living with HIV in Zambia to try and understand how do you really ask about violence? Do you ask about mental health? Do you just assume that a young mother is really in extra need? And then how do you link to existing services in places where, you know, very, very um, highly specialized psychiatric or, or mental health support may not be available? Keep it up, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elona. We have now five minutes for questions to our wonderful keynote speaker and abstract presentation. One, Over there, one, two, three, four. four. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, good morning once again. My name is Petronella from the Zambian Hub. So before I make my comment, just a quick show of hands. How many of us in here, when we have a crush, when we meet someone, do we sit down and say, are we going to use condoms? Are we going to use PrEP? How many of us have ever done that with someone we've liked or been in a relationship with? Has anybody in this room ever met someone they liked or they're in a relationship with and they've sat down and said, we'll use condoms because of ABC or we'll use PrEP as a, as a me method of um, protection? How many of us in here? Yes, in a relationship, a crush, someone you want to have sex with, how many of us have ever sat down? Right? So 
it's a very uncomfortable conversation to have um, with, with someone that you like to talk, to sit down and say, these are the uh, preventive measures that we can use. So my point is that um, we're talking about PrEP and it's one of the um, preventive measures that we can use. And to borrow from your term, you did say that um, PrEP is not just a user, con uh, a, a user controlled HIV prevention, but it's highly dependent on the complex complexities of social fabrics. So what I'm trying to drive at is that I think in our programming, it's very important for us to start um, putting in relationship skills because at the end of the day, these relationship skills will, um, if comprehensively put together, can address issues of substance abuse, stigma and discrimination, and IPV that I've seen that is very apparent in a lot of studies. So I really think that going forward in our programming, it's really important um, for us to start um, including relationship skills as a part of um, a way we can curb um, HIV prevention in young people. Thank you so much. Wow, thank you. What, do you want to comment or go to the next question? Next question. Thank you very much, um, Ford uh, from Zambia. So um, she outlined, uh, sorry, sorry, I've forgotten your name. Okay, yes, Madam Constance uh, outlined uh, some of uh, the challenges in line with PrEP, as in uh, uh, some of the young people have been uh, maybe stopped from taking PrEP because of different reasons, and uh, mostly uh, it's from parents They've been told, why are you taking PrEP? Uh, what's the reason you're, uh, you're, you're, what's the reason you're taking PrEP? Yeah, so uh, most of our young people have different reasons in which they want to take PrEP. Some it's not only through sex. Some it's uh, through maybe they've been, um, they know to say, okay, I'm going to be doing this, so I might be exposed. So that's why they're taking PrEP. So my, my question is, um, from what I've heard, that uh, so many young people are having these barriers to taking PrEP. So what are we going uh, to do to help us young people so that we understand better what PrEP is? Because when you look at it, in our communities, in our communities, let's not hide from the fact that uh, most of our community members, especially young people, don't know much about PrEP. What PrEP is, how it works, the only thing they know is that PrEP is an, AR, uh, it's an ARV drug. They take it as it, uh, people have to take it, those who are on art, those who are HIV positive, but that's not the case. It's just a preventive measure for HIV. So what, are we, what measures are we putting in place uh, to help uh, young people out there get the information they need to know about what PrEP is, even our parents, because they're the key stakeholders. Thank you very much. There are more of researchers than program implementers, but what we feel needs to be done is there has to be dialogue. We have to put the word peace at the top. And we have to remember that these adolescent girls and young women do not live in isolation of the community itself. So dialogue has to start community level. Adolescent girls and young women, the health care system itself, and say how best can we help them so that they are protected. Because we cannot continue putting our hair, burying our heads in the sand and say things are okay when they are not okay. Things have happened. What's the way forward? Let's have proper discussion. Let's have youth friendly corners or some way suggesting at these health facilities, can we have youth nurses, not like a mother looking kind of a nurse sitting at the end of the desk. We want somebody who understands what I'm going through not somebody who thinks 
they have to tell me what I need to do when I've done it already. I can't tell her I've done it already. Please <laughs> give me somebody that I relate with. So those are some of the proposals that we are putting across to government and all these organizations. Thank you. Just, just to add something quickly around relationship building and linking it to communities, I think we just have to be careful that we're not expecting the young person to do all the work. So mm -hmm. let's do that. Mm -hmm. We all could use help in talking to our partners and negotiating. Mm -hmm. And no one more than young people who are just also doing, sometimes it's your first relationship. It's very normal to need help. A lot of the gender norms that we are mentioning that also require community work. And um, you know, I think what Constance mentioned in terms of these platforms bringing together, we do have methods, community conversations, there are other approaches to do this in the implementation space, not necessarily in the research space, but sometimes in both. So, and to acknowledge that it will be hard work. These are very difficult conversations. Over. One more question, and then we need to uh, go to our panels where we're going to discuss more of this idea in detail. Over there. Uh, thank you so much. My name is Imano Chilongo from Tabene Youth Advocacy Network in Zambia. So mostly, I don't know if it's a concern or a question, but I'll mix them both. Uh, looking at uh, the presentation from uh, Madam uh, Constance concerning the uh, prep on adolescent girls and young women, now, and we know to say it's quite difficult. Uh, it's easy to access prep than to maintain it. It's just the same with people that are living with HIV. And looking at these young people who are HIV negative, most what comes in mind when you start PrEP is that if people find out you are taking PrEP, they will say to say you are also HIV positive, which is making it difficult to maintain on being on, on PrEP. Most of these young people want to be on PrEP, but to maintain it, because the influence and the environment that we are associating is it, it's what makes it to be difficult and you find that most of these people can be enrolled in PrEP in, uh, and initiated but uh, they were just going to pack the medication and others they will throw it away. We have seen I myself who has been living with HIV for the past 16 years, I can testify to say adherence is not something that is easy and when to somebody who is not HIV positive and taking PrEP daily, it's more like you're just also living uh, a positive life which is very difficult. So we have to put some measured and most uh, the most mistakes that we make is that we are doing most of the intervention in at the healthy facilities but we are forgetting that everything starts in the community we need more engagement from the communities if we want to um, if we want to have a lot of young people be put on prep for HIV prevention we need face the community we need parents and guardians and young people thank you so much Well, now I would like to hear a last round of applause for our amazing presenters. And thank you so much. I'd like you to excuse. And now I would like to invite my fellow panelists or chatalists. We will come, uh, who will come and join me for a conversation about really concrete ideas on how we overcome the issues. First, I'd like to present you to my dear colleague, Anna Sango. She's from Zimbabwe, and she's an advocacy officer for the Ending Pediatrics AIDS on Children program, EPIC, at the Global Network of People Living with HIV. The gorgeous Lion Mans. <laughs> He's from the Netherlands, where he works as a lobbyist for AIDS funds. He's also a long-time uh, uh, SRHR youth activist, and now he's a candidate for the next parliament elections in the Netherlands. So the Dutch in the house, <laughs> vote for him. Um, my dear co-chair, Agatha Dafarel, she's from Indonesia. My fellow co-chair for this session and the program manager at Intimutan Indonesia. And last but not least, our dear Lupa Kisio Robert Bukuku. Lupa. 
He's from the network of young people living with HIV in Tanzania. He's also a member of AfroCAP and of the UNITAID Communities Delegation. And he's also a clinician by profession and abstract writer. Chic. Okay, thank you so much for joining me here today. And uh, we heard a bit more um, detail framing of the issues around gender, sexuality stigma that continue to impose barriers on the fulfillment for sexual health and well-being among young people and young people living with HIV. So now I'd like you to ask a few questions because you as activists, as program implementers, lobbyists, um, you have personal experiences, but also concrete ideas to inspire the implementers, the funders, the pharma industry in the room about how to implement concrete action for overcoming the issues we just heard here. So I'd like to start with Anna, since our last presentation was about um, young women living with HIV, and we heard a lot from Constance about the sexuality stigmas on adolescent girls' sexuality. I'd like to, to, to hear from you. What kind of interventions could minimize the effect of community stigma on sexuality and lead girls to empower themselves, protect and care for themselves? Great, thank you so much Alini and thank you to the presenters. I think they did a very wonderful job in terms of explaining some of the challenges and also um, from the floor there were really a lot of recommendations around uh, what can be done. So yeah, maybe first let me just do a round check. Um, how many understand what sex is all about or what sex is? Me. Sometimes I'm a bit confused. Okay, okay. Oh, all right, interesting. How many have had sex in the last month? I know. <laughs> okay, people are not having sex. I'm worried. <laughs> last, night? last month. Oh, last but night. but oh, last but yeah, yes, but 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 it's interesting because I'm thinking within the room we have like a diverse group of people in terms of age, in terms of gender, and then also we're even kind of not sure about sex and really not even open about maybe acknowledging if we had sex last month or whenever, but probably it did happen, right? So here we are talking about adolescent girls and young women, right? Who are in the context of maybe living with HIV, uh, maybe identifying uh, as, you know, um, a lesbian or trans, you know? And also dealing with the issue of having to take treatment, but also then dealing with the issue of the community, judging them for being horny which is normal, right? Yeah. I mean, we, we all get that. We all feel that, right? Yes. And they are in these communities, like Constance said, they are in the church, they are in the community, they are in school. So you find that it's, it's a lot of challenges. It's a lot of issues for them to really have the agency. And as a community, we're also not doing so much in terms of safeguarding or supporting um, these young women and these adolescent girls. So you ask a question, Alini, around how do we minimize community stigma? How do we try and help these adolescent girls navigate through life, navigate through sex, navigate through relationships? Someone talked about relationship. I think really it's, it's about creating an environment that they can be able to speak boldly about sex, give them the necessary tools, empower them to be able to understand what their bodies are all about. And it starts from probably even at family level. I mean, I remember when I started menstruating and when I talked about it at home, and probably that was the first encounter of a sexual conversation with my parents was, don't smile at boys, you'll get pregnant. <laughs> and then I didn't understand that. But it never went as deep as saying, okay, so now that you're a semi-woman, okay, and then if you have sex and if you have unprotected sex, you probably might get pregnant. You see, so those conversations don't go as deep as that. And that's where the community comes in because the family is in the community. Constance talked about the church. Young people, adolescent girls are having sex in the church. But the church has been made, has been made into an environment whereby you only talk about sex when you're planning on getting married, when you bring your partner 
to your pastor and then you start talking about sex. Why don't we use those as entry points to talk about sexual health, to talk about also access to prevention tools and commodities for HIV within that space? So I really think it's about looking at what is there in the community right now. I know at some point in the past two days we talked about culture and we talked about how dynamic culture is. And we also know how difficult it is to infiltrate culture because it's there. It won't go away. But how do we utilize certain entry points within culture that can navigate us into talking about sex, into sharing positive messaging around sex? Let boys and girls understand their bodies, know how their bodies work, know that it's okay to have wet dreams, know that it's okay to feel this, it's okay to do that, and then help them understand the how or the what they need to do when that happens. So I don't know if I've answered your question entirely, but... Yeah. Thank you. The community and cultural entry points are great ideas. And Anna, just a quick follow-up question. If it's hard for us as adolescent girls to navigate sexuality, I imagine that it must be very challenging for an adolescent girl living with HIV, starting to feel horny, and uh, uh, having to navigate the HIV and sexuality double stigma. So for them, how do you advise us to create an empowering environment? So I, I'll still go back to also community and facilities. I think there's really need to ensure that um, we have a comprehensive package for adolescent girls and young women all their lives because they are on art. So all their lives, they're going to be engaging with a health facility at one point or the other. Uh, not if, if not all the time, they're going to be engaging with uh, peers and also uh, within peer-led interventions. So I think it's good to make sure that the peer-led supporters are equipped to be able to assist their peers as well, to deliver the correct and consistent information, to be able to guide them in terms of accessing treatment and also being able to access prevention uh, methods. Um, from the floor, I think someone spoke about, you know, taking PrEP and then also relating it to having to take antiretrovirals every day, the pill burden, the fatigue. We all know that the depression that is associated with that. So I feel like the comprehensive package really needs to look into all those issues, really needs to address mental health issues, really needs to address the dep dep depression issues so that this adolescent, this young woman living with HIV is within a mental state that they can fully access, you know, services and then they can do away fear because we know as long as you fear something, it becomes difficult for you to fully access the care that you need if you're afraid. But if the environments are made in a way whereby I'm not afraid to talk to either my peer, I'm not afraid to talk to a youth looking nurse, not the motherly looking nurse, like what Constance said, but also, I am empowered enough to have the agency to be proactive when it comes to my health and well-being. Yes. yes, and to be able to enjoy pleasure as well, right? This is a key part of sexual health. And I would like to hear from my colleague Lupa about a very other important side, side of the equation, right? Which is... Um, engaging adolescent boys and, adole and, and young men, right? So do you have any ideas about how we could help to challenge toxic masculinity that creates risk behaviors that leads to more infections and gender-based violence? Okay. Uh, first, uh, we all understand that uh, the young boys are uh, are using this uh, toxic masculinity as the defensive mechanism uh, and this is influenced by uh, the culture and the social norms in our community. But this tends to turn uh, into a negative trait as uh, because it translates to many forms of gender violences. Uh, also, unfortunately, um, uh, this uh, toxic, toxic masculinity has been an uh, uncomfortable uh, conversation in our community, so we do not, we do not address it in our public spaces. So the question is, how will we address the, this topic uh, in the diverse of the of the genders? <coughs> Firstly, I think uh, we should integrate uh, the foundation school curriculums that will, in, since at the foundation at the early ages, which will include the. So the studies which will include a comprehensive sexual education that will able to elaborate issues concerning 
gender equalities as well as the harm, harm stereotypes uh, score. Also, 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 I like to like um, advise like uh, uh, in what about the patrio, the imbalance of patrio and matrimonial system. This imbalance tends to the, this imbalance tends to pairing to 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 create this tox toxic toxic uh, masculinity. But um, also, I like to encourage the open dialogues in our communities about all issues concerning toxic masculinity and their negative impacts uh, in the community. So. Thank you. And uh, for reminding us that toxic masculinity is a performance that is repeated and yeah. it's inspired by our parents, by our community. Now I'd like you to wear your Afrocab hat because we talked about pill fatigue and the difficulty to adhere to PrEP even after you access it, right? What are some of the actions that need to be taken to ensure that there is an increased uptake of PrEP among uh, girls but also among young key population given some of the issues that were raised here? Okay. Uh, first, of, first of all, we understand that uh, the use of the oral preps to young uh, young women on the and the young population, it has been a problem because uh, it creates uh, various types of stigma on them. So, but uh, we have this uh, modern technologies, the long acting. So, what I think now we should promote or we should create uh, a form whereby the young the young women, the adolescent, could have variety of options of the, these preps, for example, they, uh, they can use the pills for those who are comfortable with, with it and those who are not comfortable with it, they can use the injection. And also the studies show that uh, the other technologies are coming such as the implants and the antibodies. Uh, yeah. So, but there is a challenge and the problem. How will this new technology be accessible in low and middle income countries? I know the VIVs are here, yeah? Also, now we call upon to them, the drug manufacturers like VIV and JJ, to, have, to early distribute the patents so as the generic manufacturers can produce this drug, which will help this drug to be accessible at affordable prices. Um, I think that's, that's all. Yeah. Thanks. Do you want to add anything about choice? I do. I do. Um, I think the, the, the importance of um, choosing something is that it gives young people the driver's seat. So I think like since the first day we've talked about the importance of putting young people in the driver's seat, right? And I think it's not limited to only those who are programmatic, but it's also important to ensure that all young people are in the driver's seat to choose the best intervention for their health in any context, but in this context for HIV and as um, uh, health. Because when you want to give someone a choice, you already wrong because you don't get to give someone a choice. You, you, you were never given the power. The power were always theirs by default. Thank you. Agatha, and I'd like to come back to you about an issue that was a very hot topic in this conference, which is about parental consent for accessing SRHR services. I'd like you to talk from the point of view of an uh, adolescent key population, right? Transgender girl. Does it work for young key population, parental consent? And if yes or no, why? Okay, thank you. The answer is no. I rest my case. <laughs> no, because listen, here's the thing. Who in this room felt that when they are growing up, the parents aren't the safe people to go to? 
who felt that they their parents are not the safe are people not. to go to well are not safe people well a lot of you have wonderful parents thank god thank you so much so listen in indonesia 71% of violence were caused were happened inside the home the house the call were always from inside of the house can you imagine like the house the home that are supposed to be the safe space for young people to go home to to sleep to be loved are actually the safe place for them to even be themselves and this will link to another fact that sadly 120% young LGBT people have higher risk of experiencing homelessness. This is because of either they're getting kicked out or they run away from their homes. And the numbers are even higher in the transgender women. Like in Indonesia, a lot of transgender women have to run away from the home for the uh, hometown because it wasn't necessarily the safest place for them to express themselves so then they ran to the bigger city usually um, the capital city of Indonesia Jakarta and they engage in sex work when they aren't even 17 year old but then because of the risks of you know contacting HIV they have to get tested right but because of the parental consent they weren't able to get tested because of course at the end of the day it's parents choice darling so is it effective and is it answering answering the problem if we resort the case all to the parental consents for adolescents key populations to access the hiv test i would say no because parents most if not all most parents are not humans well i think this is also opens the case for us to engage the parents but also to help them to challenge their social stigmas and prejudices of course there are avenues to work with parents but um very important that you highlighted the first point of care if we rely on that, it might not be, may not work for adolescents in their diversity. Thank you so much, Agatha. And now, Lyle, I'd like to ask you, based on your experience of accessing sexuality education and on your activism as well, what are the aspects of CSE that need to change to challenge uh, self-stigma um, mainly among young populations and to promote well-being among them yeah um, thank you Aline I can maybe answer your question also from a personal experience so uh, when I was in high school uh, I was a gay man and I was looking for information on how to uh, protect my sexual health uh, actually at the age of 18 I also started to do sex work uh, in the Netherlands to enable for me to pay for my travels to be able to learn languages and to pay for my studies so obviously, I was in dire need of good information um, that would enable me to protect my sexual health. Um, and back then, I was in high school in Belgium. We actually got um, a sexuality education from a biology teacher who did not really like to talk about sex so much. And the only, there were two problems with what she said. Uh, first of all, when it came to gay sex, she only mentioned it one, and she said, do not do it. And the second thing was, uh, in terms of risks, that was the only thing that they could talk about. So what consequence did this have in me and the classroom and also in my peers? In terms of the risks, everybody started to become afraid of sex. It did not mean that they not, were not going to have sex. They had as much sex as they would have had with a different approach, but it was only focused on fear. And we know that when fear is not a good motivator to protect your sexual health. So the other issue with me was that my teacher basically was telling me, you cannot talk to me about being gay because she said that I should not have gay sex and it meant that the first time I had sex with my boyfriend we actually wanted to use a condom but the condom broke because we did not use any loop mm. 
So we did not have the good information on how to properly um, protect ourselves. So what does this teach us about sexuality education? And I think many people uh, are struggling to have these conversations in the classroom. Uh, first of all, um, it's good to have sexuality education in the classroom. At least it led me to uh, using the condom, so that's something. But it needs to be uh, stigma-free, and it needs to be a broader conversation than only about risks. And sometimes we are not so comfortable to talk with our teachers about sex, and sometimes our teachers are not so comfortable to talk about sex with us. So we can also look at other uh, options. Do we get peer educators uh, inside who have been trained to do open this conversation in a more stigma-free way? Uh, or do we have to train the teachers uh, to make them more comfortable to engage in these conversations? So there's different ways how to do this. Um, but we also have to think about outside of the classroom. Uh, for me, what has been a great help were community health centers. We had the Amsterdam Center of Sex Work, and it was the first time that I could have a stigma-free conversation about me being a sex worker and being able to get the information that I needed. Because these nurses were specialized, they knew the community, and they were trained to be able to create trust. So these community centers are extremely important. And then also peer support groups. When later I got diagnosed with my HIV, I was really, really sad. And maybe if you're sad, it's not the best place to be adherent. So for me, a way to learn to accept myself was go to the Association of People Living with HIV, have peer support groups, and that gave me the strength to overcome my fears, to overcome my sadness, and to start taking care of myself. So what we need is reliable education, peer support, um, and reliable information that is stigma-free. And I think if we do these things, we can make great changes. Thank you for reminding me of the clinic in Amsterdam. I access it as well as a sex worker. And the great thing about there is that they respect your privacy. You don't need to give your real name, just your war name and the phone number and and that's it yes thank you so much and now like um we don't have time for questions right okay so i'll ask my panelists to close this panel by saying in one phrase what does sexual health and well-being mean to you start with lupa uh, <clears throat> for me it's like uh it's a state of being a physical, emotional, and uh, social f fit in relationship to the sexual experiences in relationships. Uh, that's uh, for me, it means sex that is fun, sex that's based on consent, and where you give pleasure to each other, uh, and where you are also, uh, of course, protecting your health. Um, for me, it's informed, consensual, safe, and pleasurable, definitely. Yes. As a 21-year-old transgender woman, born in a very strict conservative Muslim family, I will say it's everything because I need pleasure. For me, is a sex that doesn't uh, put me in danger of being criminalized, stigmatized, and of course, sex that is delicious. Thank you so much. A last round of applause for uh, our panelists. And I hope this inspires you to have conversations about safe, empowering, and delicious sex in the rest of the day. <laughs>